Fiction and reality. New stories, new ideas. Little Beth Entertainment. Welcome to episode 110 of The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. It's a workshop episode, and we're joined by one of the new generation of rocketeers. Zyla Foxland joins us. We'll talk rockets and what she's been up to and so much more that happens right after this on The Rocketry Show. Stick around. The Rocketry Show would like to thank these listeners for their personal support of the podcast. JohnRocket.com, Jimmy Burgess, Jason Rodney, Sean Falkingham, Conway Stevens, Paul Olivieri, Sam Feinberg, Michael Aylward, Brian Schenkenberger, E. Hutnell, John Thompson, Mark McBride, Doug Wade, C. McCauley, Carl Hunting, the Piedmont Student Launch Team, Steve S., Chris Irving, David Simmons, SBR Rocketry, John Kusher, Christopher Short, Kelsey Black, Ryan Reniger. If you wish to show your support for The Rocketry Show, just visit us at support. TheRocketryShow.com. The Rocketry Show thanks RocketryForum.com for their support. This is Jesse, and I've been a member for four years. The Rocketry Forum is a global community of rocketeers who openly discuss all aspects of hobby rocketry. If you have a question, hop on and ask. There are hundreds of experts who can answer just about any rocketry question you have. You can also find me by searching for Model Rocket Guy, and I'll be happy to help any way that I can. Check them out today at RocketryForum.com. Welcome to the Rocketry Show. All right, uh, lift off and the clock is started. Yes, sir. Be loud and clear. A podcast that is all about advanced and high power rocketry. Amateur built rockets starting at mid power to higher power versions that can reach the edges of space. This program is hosted by the team who love the smell of burning ammonium perchlorate in the morning. Here are CG, Gene, and model rocket guy, Jesse Yu. Welcome to episode 110 of The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com, the award-winning rocketryshow.com. Mm. Yes. I am CG. I'm Gene. And I'm model rocket guy, Jesse Yu. All righty. And we got the intro that we were teasing about, ammonium perchlorate, in the morning is back. Yay! Yay! <laughs> yes. By popular demand. Yes. And this is a workshop episode of The Rocketry Show. And it's going to be a fun one. We've got a very special guest that uh, Jim has tracked down. So I'll toss it over to Jim to get things going on because you, you worked at this one. You tracked our guest down. <laughs> well, it all started with Twitter, let's say. Um, so I'm cruising around Twitter and I'm watching Joe Barnard do his level three out in the desert out at, at FAR, which is, as you guys know, is a pretty fun place that I, I really like going out to. I'm trying to remember real quick. Sorry to interrupt. Did we hmm. did we talk about the, the Joe's uh, FAR experience on the show? Well, we didn't really, we, we mentioned it a little bit that yeah. he was going to go and attempt his level three and some of the things that happened. But um, yeah, but it turned out to be, we, we mentioned it a little bit. Okay. But, I'm but to remember. for the we can bring, yeah, sure, sure, we can bring it up real quick. Um, as as most of you guys out there know, uh, Joe Barnard was doing his level three out at Far, which is in the Mojave Desert out in California, and I wanted to see his attempt, and I did, and I saw a few other things. There were some other videos posted by some other rocket people, and on Twitter there was a hashtag that popped up that was hashtag Hot Nozzle Summer. So I started following it, and I ran across a video of a woman who was doing, at the same time she was working with Joe, she knows him, then she she was doing her level two on a hand fiberglass rocket that had like very fine hardwood veneer on it, which was amazing build quality. And this video is like maybe about, oh, 30, 40 minutes of, of her going through the build process and how she got it put together. And we happen to have that person. It's Zyla Foxlin, um, originally from back east, but now living in California. So welcome to the show, Zyla. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. So and and as I think the thing that was that really struck me about your video was the build quality. Um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in rocketry and and how that like ties in with other things that you do? Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's funny. I feel like I sort of tripped and fell and stumbled into rocket Twitter <laughs> or like the, the space community uh, because I've I've only launched two rockets in my life and it was my 
I, so I've attended two rocket launches, right? It was my level one certification rocket and my level two certification <laughs> rocket. Like I've never launched a rocket that was not a high power rocket. Yeah, so basically I got my oh, level one certification in uh, the fall of my freshman year of college and I went to Case Western Reserve out in Cleveland, kind of close to where you guys are. <laughs> um, and so I just on a whim joined the rocket team my freshman year Built my level one certification rocket. Its name was Lumiere after the candle from Beauty and the Beast because like, yep. you got to light that Disney. candle. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, nice. Plus, like my my kind of my goal of going to engineering school was to be an Imagineer anyway. So all of the things, nice. especially in that era of my life, I named after Disney characters. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I flew my level one. I got certified, and then. Um, it, like in this sort of complicated, like had sort of a falling out with Rocket Team and also became president of a robotics team at the same time. Um, <laughs> okay. And so I ended up quitting Rocket Team and just doing robotics. And it was Astro Robotics. It was a NASA robotic mining competition team. Um, but I like stopped thinking about rockets because now my every waking hour was devoted to robots. <laughs> um, so... That was my very first level one certification rocket. And then in the last like year or two, I sort of developed this boat building habit. And I, if anyone has any tips on how to kick that <laughs> habit, my garage would love to know. Uh, <laughs> and my storage fees would love to know. Uh, but I, when I built a cedar strip canoe and in building this cedar strip canoe, I sort of like, it was my first time fiberglassing. And I was like, oh, yeah. whoa, this is magic. Like I, I knew of composite work being done <laughs> in college, but like not a lot of the students were doing composites. So I had just never done it. I'd never done a carbon fiber layup um, or a fiberglass layup. And I got this idea in my head that like, what, what if I made a clear boat? Like, could I just lay up a bunch of clear fiberglass with clear epoxy and end up with a clear boat? Uh, <laughs> and, and so I decided to do it. And in doing it, I like asked Twitter if anyone knew about composites. And the first person who responded to me was, do you guys know Charlie Garcia? Astro Chuck. Yes. Yeah, I know so often. he responded... Um, and we chatted about composites for a little bit, but then we ended up t chatting about rockets. And I was like, man, I really wish that I had continued, like built another rocket. I did my level one and it was really fun. Um, would love to do it again sometime. And he was like, oh yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And then a month later he messaged me and he was like, hey, uh, me and Joe and a bunch of other people are going to go launch some rockets. You want to come? And I was like, uh, what what kind of rocket do I build? And he was like, well, you're level two. And I was like, okay. So um, that's that's how I ended up with my level two. <laughs> then I, I did the classic, uh, the classic maneuver of procrastinating and then starting to build my rocket five days before launch. You know, the thing that's amazing though is you know exactly what you're doing with it. It's not like you're just throwing fins on a tube and calling it a day and sticking a motor in it. I mean, you're, you're very... A thorough about your your design process, the reasons for how you do stuff and why you do stuff. It's it's pretty evident in the video that you created, which has over one hundred and thirty thousand views by now. I think we'll put a link to that on our web on our web page. But but check it out, guys, if you haven't seen it yet. But it, you're very thorough about the process, and you take it very seriously with a little bit of fun on top. So I think it's pretty cool on how how you approach that. So. Um, when you got into, well, like, what what made you decide to like um, to work on? Can you talk a little bit about Fifi, which was your level two rocket, and what how the design process worked in your mind and how you went about putting it all together? Yeah, I um, it was really interesting. I for sure leaned heavily on asking people who have built many more rockets than me a lot of questions, ranging from very stupid to good questions. Uh, <laughs> And that's just how the process goes is like, you know, the 3 a.m. texts that are like, hey, I think I screwed something up. Please help. <laughs> um, but I did remember tiny things from building my level one. It was six years ago. So, uh, you know, short term memory is not great, but it, it, <laughs> it is a little bit there. Good enough. Um, but I think more relevantly, the, the skills it takes to build a rocket translate to a lot of other things like... Um, a lot of the okay. things that I learned in boat building or in robotics or even in like arts uh, translate really well into 
rocketry because it's sort of like once you have a design, uh, I was I was joking, it's like advanced arts and crafts once it's already modeled in open rocket. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. Okay, so you, you go through the process and and you get it built. I mean, what what made you think about veneering with it when you know because you got your fiberglass and was that just like an uh, like what was your thought process saying I'm gonna put some wood veneer on this and I want it to be cherry wood I mean it's just it's just <laughs> fascinating to me and how that came together for you yeah so I um it was sort of like I was trying to think of a way to tie rocketry into my current audience because uh most of my popular videos on YouTube have been like really high-end woodworking videos. And so I was like, man, if I pull a racket video out of thin air, people are going to be incredibly confused. What can I do to kind of tie it together? Um, and I thought about doing a cedar strip racket, which uh, would, the, the way cedar strip construction works for something like a boat is that you, uh, you take all these thin strips of cedar that are maybe a quarter inch thick and mm -hmm. you round one side and then put a cove in the other side and then they can fit together around a curve. Um, okay. Right, right. So the kind of the original idea with the cedar strip rocket would be I could like make a cylindrical mold, put all the strips around that mold and then fiberglass over it. But then the thing with a boat that's a lot easier than with a rocket is that you have to fiberglass the other side as well because the strength comes from yeah. that composite of having f like the fiberglass wood fiberglass sandwich. Mm -hmm. Right. And so okay. I was complaining about my dilemma to Charlie and he was like, yeah, you should probably just do like a cardboard over wrap um, if you really want a fiberglass or you could just buy a fiberglass tube. And I was like, no, 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 <laughs> I'm going to do an over wrap. I want to do it myself. Um, and he was also like, you could also just buy a level two kit. And I was like, no, 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 <laughs> I'm going to do it from scratch. Uh, so the veneer came about, it was like a combination of the last two projects that I had done where um, I re, and actually this video is going to come out probably in between when we're recording right now and when this podcast actually comes out. So it should be out already if you're listening to this in real time, um, where I decided to make wood transparent. And most people who try this use balsa wood or basswood or something very light. And I wanted to see if I could do it with oak. Um, so I ended, up ha I ended up buying a bunch of oak veneer um, because I, st I, needed, I still needed it thin enough that the chemicals could sort of like permeate through... Right. The entirety of the wood. So I had all this oak veneer sitting around. And then uh, the project before that, I had made a map of the United States that was made out of wood, like each state was made out of wood that was grown in that state. Mm -hmm. oh, and cool. um, it started from when I moved from Ohio to California, I like picked up a piece of wood in every state that I drove through. And then for the rest of the states, I had yeah fans like mail me wood from their state, which was awesome. Um, they came with so many stories, but there was one, I had two really cool pieces from Alabama um, and I could only use one because Alabama was only one state. And one of them <laughs> was a, a cherry veneer that had grown on a fan's like family farm and was logged and milled by their grandfather. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, and they like sent me a couple pieces of this and I was really sad that I couldn't use it in this map. So I was looking for another reason to use it. And so I was like staring at this rocket. Uh, well, the rocket didn't exist yet. I was staring at like the idea of this rocket and also this these veneers. Um, and I was like, man, what if I veneered a rocket? How ridiculous would that be? Uh, and then I didn't think about it again. I just did it. <laughs> Perfect. That's, I love your style for that. I mean, because, you know, you had something and you just ran with it and you took all of the skills that you had learned from previous other projects and, and materials from other things and just kind of made it all work together into, into a beautiful flying machine. That's so cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that there's like something to be said for bringing in a completely random person who has nothing to do with the hobby <laughs> to just you know shake, <laughs> shake things up a little bit and see what kind of shenanigans they can get up to. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's great because, you know, there's with rocketry, it's kind of a small kind of a group. But um, and uh, there's like there's a school of thought that's like, ah, you know, things aren't going to change and, you know, nobody's getting into it anymore, but that's OK. And then, you know, that's that. But then there's people that are actually excited about it. And I, I'm a coach of a of a high school team, so I try and get and without SpaceX awesome. and all the 
aerospace things going on. It's really cool. I think I want to bring in all the kids because I want them to enjoy the coolness that I have. And and it's kind of cool because like you're at that bridge and with the whole hot nozzle summer thing that's exploded on Twitter, it, it's just been amazing. Yeah. Could you go into a little bit about the genesis of how hot nozzle summer came about and then what's happening now a little bit? Yeah, so I think, and okay, I, I can take no credit for Hot Nozzle Summer. Um, I'm like not on the organizing committee, nor did I come up with the hashtag. But okay. I, th- I think my understanding of it is that, so like the group of us went out to the Mojave and what was supposed to be a one day launch turned into like two weeks <laughs> because right. um, we we all got to an Airbnb and we were incredibly careful. We all got tested before and after and we quarantined and households consolidated beforehand. So like, I don't want anyone to think we were being irresponsible. Uh, but we all, there was like nine of us that ended up in this Airbnb and there is so much group energy because we've all been like cooped up for a year and a half now, I guess a year, a little more than a year. Uh, mm-hmm. And suddenly we're in a room with like eight other people that, are as passionate about building things as you are. So there's kind of this energy. And then (laughs) there was also, because we were all Twitter friends, everyone sort of like talked in Twitter memes a little bit. (laughs) Uh, And that totally bled into the way we started just like tweeting from the event. Um, So then we we went to do our launch on Saturday and uh, you, you, you guys a lot of people listening to this probably know that Joe ended up scrubbing the launch on Saturday. So like right. the rest of the certification flights flew, but Joe decided to, and it was absolutely the right call to scrub the launch on Saturday and then fly the following Saturday under USC RPL's waiver. Uh, right. Or rather, yeah. So we got another Airbnb for another week. I just spent another week doing rocketry <laughs> and posting online about it. And so there was like a lot of other people in the rocket community that were like, wow, this looks really fun. How can I participate? And all of us were saying, wow, we don't want to go back home and not talk about rockets all the time anymore and like actually get sleep. That sounds incredibly overrated. Uh, <laughs> what if we planned another launch? And so uh, hot nozzle, I think hot nozzle summer might have been coined by Kate, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, And it was, yeah, that's, so now a bunch of people who were at this launch are like the organizers of doing an an organized event where a bunch of people get certifications out at FAR this summer. Right. It's going to be at FAR and there's a date and an event set. I mean, I was watching this thing from the sidelines, just watching it explode on Twitter and people are getting interested and the energy level is off the roof on this stuff, which is really exciting for me. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you guys, you guys are bringing it to the table, and I love that. And you know, I mean, and just to keep it going, and just to get people into the hobby, because flying rockets is the coolest thing in the world, right? I mean, you know. yeah, and it's sort of, I think, like the combination of a bunch of us, and like we had a, a really diverse group. Like there was kind of somebody for everyone flying rockets that day, um, and to see like a bunch of people that maybe you look up to getting certified all at the same time. Um, you, there's definitely an energy of like, oh, I want to, I want to do that too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's been, it's been really, really cool. And um, like Jenna uh, has been putting in like a Herculean effort in organizing and making sure that as many people can get certified as possible. You know, uh, how, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, it's, it's been really exciting to watch, you know, it, the the next generation of rocketeers come along and the previous episode we talked to the Oklahoma State University team and you know with them winning the Argonia Cup award and we talked to the University of Akron Akronauts and there's so many other teams you know college you know teams and high school teams that are have these members that are getting into these rocket competitions and things so so when uh, Gene told me about the hot nozzle summer it was kind of like, oh wow, this is this is energy from a whole nother you know, realm of folks that you know are kind of outside the normal bubbles of rocketry, and uh, yep. we were just kind of really intrigued by the what was going on with hot nozzle summer. I mean, we still are, so this has been yeah. really cool. I think one of the things that I, th- I find really cool is you have a bunch of people who have aerospace engineering degrees and they work at like one of the big aerospace companies, um, but yeah. they've never actually like built their own rocket from start to finish, and. <laughs> That curiosity is like 
deep down part of what dra- drove them to go into the field to start with. Um, and so sort of right. seeing the steps laid out for you clearly makes it so easy to just jump on the train and excitedly get a certification. Especially because a level one certification is the the barrier to entry is so low that it's worth it. As if, if you have a launch site and there's like a person to certify you there already, like you don't have to take a written test. It's, you just have to build the rocket. Right. Yeah, and then it gets progressively more interesting as you go up <laughs> through the levels. But um, yes. yeah, and, and yes. the testing is important, very important. And with the with the younger kids, my kids have to take a level one test for their junior certifications because they're not eighteen. But highly right. important that they do that. So you know, because we because yeah. you, you guys keep the energy. But what's really also cool is you keep um, keep your eye on the safety aspects of it too because you're engineers. You know, I mean that's yes. and that's that's the thing that I think is really cool because. You, you bring this incredible energy, but you're also in the back of your minds. You guys are all aerospace engineers, and you know what you're doing with it. So you can, so you, you're showing people that you can still have balls out fun, and and still keep the safety margins. So I mean, it's incredible to me. Yeah, yeah, it is definitely like put put a bunch of smart people in a room and see what kind of shenanigans they can get get up to. And like, <laughs> there will still be there will be shenanigans, like, but it will be done with like the important amount of care. <laughs> <laughs> and now one thing I want to bring up is since we brought up talking about level one, we get regular questions from folks all the time. Like, you know, you, know, you guys are all about the high power rocketry. I want to get into that. What do I need to know to, to get my level one certification? Can you do a show on level one certifications? And I think we've done some in the past, but the problem is, is that those episodes kind of get lost over time. Um, so... Right. What I want to do is, you know, whenever we bring up stuff like this, my thought is, let's talk a little bit about some of the aspects of a level one certification from people who've, who've been by there and um, what it was like to get their certifications and what they had to think about. And that way we can keep the topic alive and diff- have different aspects over time. So I figured this would be a good point here to talk about, you know, the... Now you come at it where your very first rocket was a level one <laughs> rocket. Yes. <laughs> so, so yeah. For someone who just kind of exploded on the scene like that, how did you learn to do your level one? What you know, where, who did you learn from, and, and what materials did you read about? Yeah. So I um, was probably in a, a, a unique situation where I did my level one as part of a rocket team, a collegiate rocket team. So. Um, a lot of it was organized for me where I didn't have to find a a person from NAR to certify the right, flight. Right, right. Um, I didn't have to find a launch site uh, on my own. I didn't even have to find right. a ride to the launch site, right? Like I carpooled there. Um, so a lot of the, like the little things that are really intimidating were taken care of for me. So the only thing I had to do was build a rocket. Uh, and the rocket itself, I mean, like, was coached by older members of the team. Um, mm-hmm. But we, I feel like a better example is, so we had that first launch on Saturday. And then uh, when we just, when Joe scrubbed and we decided to launch again the following weekend, there was a woman, Jenna, who didn't have a certification and she hadn't planned to launch with us. So she showed up without a rocket and then she saw all of us launch our rockets. She was like, hey, you think I could build a level one certification rocket in a week and fly it next weekend um, with the other two rockets? And everyone was like, yes, do it. And so, <laughs> you know, she put in, it was a, it was a, a three inch kit from Mad Cow, uh, mm-hmm. just like the, the $70 cardboard tube kit, which is yeah, more sure. than enough to get a level one certification. And she put that together in my garage going between like my apartment and the Airbnb and got her certification. And for anybody who's doing model rockets, another way to get there, uh, and you want to go to your level one, but you're a little nervous about it, I would say a good reference book to read is Modern High Power Rocketry, that book. I think there, I don't know if there's another edition other than edition two, like the Modern High Power Rocketry 2 book. But that's where I kind of saw a lot of the techniques and, and the differences between a model rocket build and a high power rocket build. And for me, I was already dabbling quite a bit in mid-power rocketry at that point. So a lot of the things that were done in a mid-power rocket were just a couple of changes beyond that to make a rocket that can handle a level one launch. So that's uh, 
So if you're if you're since we're getting a lot of questions on that, I figure I'll bring that up. And uh, the Modern High Power Rocketry Two book is a great place to start. Um, there's all kinds of great information that fills you in on what it is that's going on, why you do it that way, <laughs> and other ideas. It's got good histories too. It's, yes. it's a great book. Yes, it really is. So one of the things and, that I tried doing uh, when I did my level one is I started collecting a bunch of four inch, four inch S, I'm sorry, 2.6 inch BT-80 Estes kits. And I was like, oh my God, I really love all these big rockets. And then all of a sudden I fall on the Apogee page, right? Because I found all the Dynastar rockets. And those are BT-80, you yep. know, 2.6 inch as well. Mm-hmm. And then I started going to the store because I live like super close to it. And then I was talking to Sarah, who's, you know, the person that was at the front desk at the time. And she's the one that actually kind of got me into it. And she's like, well, if you want a level one, you, there's a lock four right over there. And we have those kits in the back and they're about some odd dollars, whatever. And then we just got these motors in and she showed me the H73s that they had from Aerotech. <laughs> and she's like, you get this aluminum casing, all this other stuff. I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? So then I go home and then I start looking at Apogee's website. And then Tim has several videos on how to build your level one rocket. And that's kind of how it intrigued me. So I was actually sold level one stuff by the person at Apogee. <laughs> so <laughs> I wouldn't have thought about doing it any other way. And then all of a sudden I had this big fat four inch rocket. And around the same time that I was doing all that stuff, my neighbor gave me a Phantom 4000 and an NCR, um, what is that? The uh, Eliminator. And uh, they were rockets that, you know, they were passed down to him. And he's like, I'm never going to do anything with these. I see that you're building rockets. If you want, uh, take these and see what you can do with them. So I, I'm like, well, the first thing is that these things need to be repainted because that's not to my standard. So I went and I, you know, <laughs> tore apart everything and sanded it down. I'm, you know, I'm sure Azila, you, you know, you know, can talk about how you do your techniques and stuff. Um, I, yeah. I love redoing finishes on stuff. And one of these days I'm going to go and redo some of Tim Van Milligan's rockets in his showroom. But we'll talk about that later. But anyway, um, <laughs> I, awesome. I was working on that NCR Eliminator and then I wound up, you know what, I'm going to start building that lock four because while I'm waiting for this primer to dry, you know, I got to wait two or three days because I didn't figure out that I could wet sand it in time. You know, I just, you know, I was like, I'm going to start building this. I'm just going to do it. So I started building the rocket and I started building it with wood glue and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to stop. I've never used epoxy. I'm going to try doing that. Then the NCR Bounty Hunter was sitting there, you know, because I had just bought that. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I should probably learn how to do epoxy on this rocket first. So I talked myself into the steps to doing it. And then I built all three rockets at the same time. It was awesome. And then I launched all three of those rockets on the same day when I got my level one. But yeah, that was, that was Apogee's fault. But I, I want you guys to know, <laughs> I want you all to know that the reason I even got into high power was because of Noob and his finishing techniques that he talked about on his blog. And I've said it many times and I'll say it again. Everything that I've done so far, it's Noob's fault. And since he's not here, we can blame him. Blame you. <laughs> All righty. And uh, speaking of which, there's a new model rocket show. The Noob is going to be talking to Chris Michelson of Model Rockets. Uh, and that's going to be fun. So check, don't awesome. forget to check that out. Yeah. Cool. So and then uh, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back. And I want to talk construction techniques um, and things. Um, because there's a few things that I saw in your videos, Isla, that was like, ah... So we'll be right back (laughs) right after this. You're listening to The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. Stay close. Lock Precision Rocketry manufactures a full line of high-quality precision fit components to meet your building, repairing, and customizing needs. Lock Precision believes in making rocket kits as light as possible while maintaining the strength required to fly with commercially available motors. Lock Precision offers a wide range of rocket kits from the 1-inch diameter Lock 1 series to high-power rockets reaching 7.6 inches in diameter. When you visit LockPrecision.com, be sure to check out their performance series kits featuring such designs as the Black Brand 10, the Caliper ISP, and the 3.1 inch diameter Iris Rocket. All of Lock Precision's performance kits comes with everything you need, including pre-slotted airframes, high-grade precision cut plywood fins and components, as well as rift-stop nylon parachutes, rugged shock cords, polypropylene nose cone, and instructions. The name Lock Precision has been synonymous with mid and high power rocketry for over 30 years. Check out LockPrecision.com to find out why. LockPrecision.com Fly higher. Fly lock. 
It's time for eRockets.biz. eRockets.biz is your home for unique model rocket kits as well as the world's largest selection of rocket parts from Semrock. They've been in business since 2009. eRockets.biz has a wide selection of your favorite kits as well as their own versions of popular out-of-production models many of you have come to enjoy over the years. Jesse, what did you find on their site? We actually have a really, really special deal going on with eRockets right now. If you look on the front page, you will see a, a small blurb up on the top of the website that says, that you know, because of the rocketry show, you get twenty dollars off um, several public missile high power rocket kits. So if you literally just click on that page, it'll take you to a special page for public missiles, and you'll notice that every one of the rockets that's on there is discounted by twenty dollars. That's awesome. One of my favorites on here specifically was the D Region Tomahawk by PML. This particular rocket is now only one hundred twenty nine ninety nine, and it's it's huge. It comes with you know G ten fiberglass fins, the phenolic tubing, and uh, you know there's several different rockets that are on there, and just the fact that you can get these off for $20 each is amazing. So go visit eRockets.biz. Look on the top banner. You'll see the Rocketry Show special for PML Rockets. Click on that link and go get yourself some fun. That's really cool. There are also plenty of other rocketry items to choose from as well, such as educational rocket kits and supplies, air rockets, water rockets, and so much more. eRockets.biz certainly has enough kits and supplies to keep you busy in your workshop for a long time to come. Need parts for your own custom builds? No problem. Problem. eRockets.biz also supplies the Semrock line of airframes, nose cones, centering rings, motor mounts, and so much more. eRockets has more rocket parts available than anyone else on Earth. Check out eRockets.biz today to learn more. eRockets.biz. If rocketry scares you, buy a train set. North Coast Rocketry, one of the first high-power rocketry kit companies ever, takes advantage of over 30 years of high-power experience by a world-class rocketeer. You can look to North Coast Rocketry to expand your high-power rocket fleet. In addition to great kits, North Coast Rocketry also stocks lots of must-have items and accessories for every rocketeer's workshop. Find out more about these kits and other great products today. Go to northcoastrocketry.com. And while you're there, don't forget to get their latest catalog, northcoastrocketry.com. Advanced rockets that are easy to build, fun to fly, and look great on display. The Rocketry Show would like to thank these listeners for their personal support of the podcast. Todd West, Jonah Cheney, Matt Tudor, Joe Sempetro, Les Rayburn, Stephen Spencer, Bill Cook, Jason Cook, Gary Rosenfield, Greg Ziegler, Toby Vanderbeek, Eric Hamilton, Ken Blade, John Beans, Scott Holland, Guy Wadsworth, Phil P., Tom Run, Stephen Ray, Amanda Ho, Steve Sainer, Mark, RailButtons.com, and Todd West. If you wish to show your support for The Rocketry Show, just visit us at support.therocketryshow.com. Welcome back to The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. CG, Jim, Jesse, along with our guest, Zyla Foxland, who's one of the uh, new, uh, gener- part of the new generation of rocketeers getting into model rocketry from their perspective corners of the world. And uh, it's the, everybody seems to have a different story of how they got drawn into rocketry. So we'll be interested to see how, you know, if we get a hold of other newcomers into the hobby and how they got drawn into things. And uh, so now what I wanted to jump into here, moving on with uh, the interview here, is uh, start getting into the workshop. You kind of talk a part of the show. And I, yeah, and I want to get into some of the construction <laughs> techniques. And the reason being is, is watching you build um, your Fifi rocket, there are some things that you're doing that are really close to what I did on my modular rockets. And, and you're, you're like... Two steps away, and maybe this will maybe this will trigger something in your in your head on this. It'll be interesting to see in a future video what you do with it. But um, <laughs> most of the listeners hear me talking about Nezuru all the time, and for Zyla, every time somebody in her studio says something, a picture of me loading Nezuru in a pad shows up on her screen. I'm sure, so <laughs> because that's my that's my 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 yes. uh, Zoom you know, picture if I'm not running the camera. Yes, this beautiful red and black and white. <laughs> yes. Yep. Rocket, looking at it right now. 
<laughs> so there's different colored sections on that rocket, and each section is it, it, color is a different section, and that rocket's kind of built modular. Mm-hmm. So the back fin can, the white section, you, if you look at it closely while I'm talking here, you'll see that there's screws that are that, that are ringing right below the black section. If you look above the black section on the silver, you'll see some screws there, and as you look up the rocket, you'll see screws. So I can, you know, disassemble the rocket. Um, and one of the things right. I did with the fin can that you're so close to is that the fin can, the fins are mounted onto the motor mount tube with centering mm-hmm. rings holding them in place, which is exactly what you did with Fifi. And yeah. um, so, and, and the one, and and they slide into the outer, you know, cow, uh, the fairing for it, you know, the, the airframe. Uh, the same way you did, where there's slots cut for the fins to go in. Yeah. But they're not, but none of it's permanent. So I can, un, so they all bolt in. The, so there's bolts that you see halfway down the white tube there of the oh, wow. of the fin can that, that mount into the, the T-nuts that are made as part of the centering ring there. And then there's another centering ring near the top where there are T-nuts in there. So I can unbolt those and slide the fin can out to do a fin repair, which I did do once. Wow, with that. man. That is awesome. Nice. I did not know that your Nezaru was like that. That is awesome, yeah, CG. Yeah, all of, all of them are like that. and, and the, That's modular, baby. Wow. Yeah, and the way... And, I guess, wow. <laughs> and that way I could change out the fins if I wanted to at some point. But, oh. the, but the way they slide in and out, it's exactly what Zyla did. When she fiberglassed the tube and they have the, the way the tubes usually ha- are usually done... Is that there's mm-hmm. the slots are cut in, of course, but then there's a back lip around there, so you have to kind of slide the fins through the hole and then you know glue to the motor mount, and then you've got to play all kinds of games to get the, you know, the to do the fillets around you know the the airframe and the and the centering ring and the and all that internally, but I just kind of made my centering ring so that they kind of lock, so I put grooves in the centering rings for the fins to slide in, and then they get glued into place, so that's where I get the strength without having an outer fill it on there and um so they slide in so when i saw that i was like oh wow she's like so close <laughs> to have her own <laughs> version of that which probably would have helped you with getting the that uh kevlar harness around the bolt down there on the top center. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah probably um what's funny is that i actually stuck my arm into the rocket so many times to make sure i could reach it uh-huh. but i didn't right. really think about like how much dexterity you need to poke a like Kevlar loop through yes. an eyeball, so I could reach it really well, but then it, it just took me a while because <laughs> uh, I even thought about it, and I was like, "Do I want to do this ahead of time?" And I was like, "No, I don't want to risk any epoxy getting on the Kevlar. I can reach <laughs> right. it; it's yes. fine." But yeah, I did do I did do through the through the wall fin uh, through the wall fins just mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. added strength, not for modularity. <laughs> Okay, so one thing that you did do on your fin can uh, on your motor mount tube with your fins is you uh, put the dye, or it's not dye, but it's like a powder or glitter. Uh, what what exactly is that stuff? <laughs> yes, because I, I keep seeing a lot of people doing that now, and and you're one of the people. I'm like, what? She's doing that too. Where where are these guys getting these colors from? Wait, did I not know? start it? I thought I started that trend. Darn. Um, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, you did. So, okay. I saw, yeah. So Zy- I could prove it. Well, okay. Yeah, Jim. Okay. <laughs> hang on. Hang on. So all all the guys and you know anything goes rocketry um you know on facebook have been doing that lately and i i i asked uh you know john brown the other day where are you getting this stuff from because just like you said that you used it to kind of see where the curing is i totally understand why you would do that and it makes a lot of sense to me and i'm trying to figure out you know uh for airfest i'm building a seven and a half inch executioner and i'm doing kind of what you're doing Zyla, mm-hmm. except I'm using a uh, carbon fiber and I'm going to make it yep. so that I can, uh, you know, put a sheen around it. And the black on the carbon fiber is going to be the color of the main rocket. And then I'm going to do the silver just in paint. And so, I mean, I'm not going to paint the black. It's going to be the carbon fiber and it's going to be nice and glossy from the fiberglass and the way that I've done it. And I was yep. asking John, how are you getting that powder? Because I want to take my US Composite 635 Slow Cure Epoxy and, um, and dye it, it so that it hides color. those fillets. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, yeah, I might need to sync with you, but if you can kind of talk about where you get in that color again, I know you mentioned it in your videos, but could you tell us, please? Yeah, for sure. So, um, I kind of just came up with the idea on a whim where uh, I dyed each batch of epoxy that I mixed up with a different color so that I could keep track of which batch was which. And so like which curing times were which, because I was using a, I had five days to build this rocket. So instead of using like a slow cure epoxy, I used a 
30 minute epoxy. Um, okay. Which gave me like less of a working time, but also uh, I'm sponsored by Total Boat, which is a boat building epoxy and varnish company. Um, mm-hmm. So I, you know, have the advantage of them just using like their products. Uh, sure. And Total Boat has also had a lot of success in like the river table market, uh, oh. which if you guys aren't familiar, it's very pop. It was, I feel like it's, I can't tell if it's going out of style. It's like definitely going out of style among woodworkers, but I think that's because it like caught on with the general public. Yeah, so, everybody started doing it after a while. Right. My wife sees those videos and she's like, oh my God, let's do that to our kitchen counters. Like, calm down, babe. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, everyone wants a river table. It's hysterical. Right. Um, Yeah. So, basically, what it is is it's like you take a slab of like a a slab of wood, which means that has a live edge, it has the bark on the two sides of it. And you cut Mm, it down the middle and then you put them, you like flip them so that there's a gap and then the bark. And then you pour usually a blue epoxy in and then you get this like river effect simulates a water sure okay yeah all yeah. right so you were using the yeah. epoxy on your fillets because you use this color first and then you want to make sure that it is tacky and so you can turn it over and it doesn't drip all over the place and then you did color two and then you kind of moved on that way right so on your fifi rocket you yeah. use two different colors to help with the the two different sections of fins all right Th- that's cool yeah. i understand where did you get yeah. that stuff because <laughs> <I need laughs> <to get> some. <laughs> yes so i use two different kinds um I st- on the interior fillets, I used Mixol pigments, which were part of Total Boat's tint kit. I think you can buy them just from Mixol directly, which is M-I-X-O-L. Okay. Um, or you can buy them from the Total Boat website and get 10% off by using my code. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know go to merch.zyla.gov. <laughs> um, yeah, and then for the exterior fillets, like when I... There's a level of sleep deprivation where I just... My brain decides <laughs> that everything I touch has to be glittery. Uh, and so for the exterior fillets, and even though I knew I was going to be painting over them, I used black diamond pigments, mica powders, and they were okay. very glittery. Okay. Cool. In case, Thank in you. case the sparkle is your vibe. <laughs> you know, it, it's the same thing with everybody wanting to paint their stuff metallic. Um, I yeah. have this uh, four inch alien interceptor and I, I talked to Ronald Dunn It's like, Hey, what color, you know, cause he designed the thing, right. And he get it, he got his level three on it. And I asked him, Hey, uh, what color did you paint that? And he's like, I painted mine glass black. And then if I looked at his profile picture and it's there leaning against his truck and I zoomed in on it, it's like, Holy crap, that is glass black. I looked at the flash for the rocket that used to be on the Mach 1 website and it looked like a Royal blue. Right. So then a, a few people, more than one told me paint a metallic. It looks like metallic blue. I'm like, I don't want to paint it metallic. So I'm going to paint that bad boy a dark royal blue and it's going to be awesome. And it's just going to be a nice. gloss royal blue. So I'm excited about that. But, you know, your, your glitter obsession awesome. is the same as everybody wanting to paint their stuff metallic. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. There's this like the, um, that Nick Offerman quote that's uh, it's sawdust is man glitter. Um, <laughs> and as a person who creates a lot of sawdust, I'm just like, what do, how about I have both? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so, guys, yeah, my hands are itchy as heck right now from freaking sawdust because in between working today, I was going over here and, you know, sanding some stuff down. And, and, and Jim, you'll love this one and, and CG, but check this out. So um, I looked at my um, Wild Mandrago uh, XL, the four inch version. I just looked at it and I got itchy. <laughs> <laughs> it, needs another, it needs another bath because, whoa, you know, I'm, I'm dying down here. So. Just yeah, well, the, the caveat on glitter is that fiberglass glitter is like the forbidden trap glitter, and we uh, don't, we don't, we don't stand fiberglass glitter the way we stand micro glitter. <laughs> ah, <laughs> Zyla, are you NAR or Tripoli? I'm NAR, um, and the only the only cool. reason I was able to get my level two was because NAR certifications don't expire. <laughs> <clears throat> True. Oh, there you go. Oh, where is that? Okay. And I figure because you can transfer them. So if I yeah, ever decide both, yep. to yeah get like ex- do experimental stuff, I can just transfer from NAR to AAA. Yeah, I'm 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 dipping into the experimental stuff as we speak. So I'm learning to make cast my own propellant. That's the fun part. Noise, noise. I'm so excited. Yeah, I, there's definitely this that. teeny tiny piece of me that wants to do a space <laughs> shot, and I'm like, well, I'd have to learn how to do. It. 
<laughs> when I was watching your videos, Isla, I noticed that you mm-hmm. had no tracking on uh, on a level yeah. two rocket that you're shooting off in the Mojave Desert. <laughs> now, I've been to that launch site. I have looked around that launch site. I have lost rockets that were five feet away from me at that launch site. How the heck did you find that rocket? <laughs> um, yeah, so I really wanted to fly avionics. Uh, and I actually, in... Last September, I launched a weather balloon. Um, and on the weather balloon, I flew a, a GPS on a flight computer as well as a spot tracker, as well as APRS. So I had like okay. lots yeah. of redundancy on that Uber balloon. Tracking. Uber tracking. Uber uh, tracking. And that's how I, I, the APRS transmitter actually was destroyed at burst. So I got like really, redundancy was a very useful thing to have. <laughs> um, but I was kind of like, okay, it's only going four and a half thousand feet. Uh, I can keep eyes on it. And it just came down to like, it's only going. (laughs) (laughs) I just didn't have a budget for telemetry um, or or for any avionics. And by the time I realized that I was like, I can't ask to borrow someone's telemetrum for a a rocket that's never been like flown before. That's a huge ask, like you know, fifty-fifty. This rocket ends Jim up. Jim has a solution in for a that. Crater. Oh yeah, yeah. I use um, I use a Marco Polo, just spot tracker. I mean, and it works okay, great. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. And I, I had a spot tracker, and I gave it to a friend who wanted to launch a weather balloon, and I don't think she ever launched the weather balloon, and now she still has my spot tracker. <laughs> sadness, um, sadness. Yeah, but I. So I ended up just like kept eyes on it all the way down and everyone at the launch site was so nice. And so I drew my line in the dirt, but also like people on the other side of the launch site drew lines in dirt for me. So we could sort of uh, triangulate, triangulate, and, triangulate. See yeah. Yeah. Yep. and make sure that we were kind of going to the right place. Uh, and then the, the, the guy in my video who was going on the desert height with me has found like, like his his record for fl- finding other people's rockets is absurd. <laughs> um, so, I like I had the confidence that there was a person with me who was very confident where we were going. I ended up finding the rocket. Um, I also Yay. found J- Joe's rocket in the desert. I would like to point out. So maybe I just have good eyes. <laughs> um, but oh, yeah, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah I just. Uh, yeah, I Dirt, dirt line and walked, walked straight towards a point. A technique that like I used is kind of a similar to, so when you're paddling a canoe on like a huge open lake and you want to make sure you're going in a straight line, because the key is that you have to be able to walk in a straight line is like you just pick a point in the distance and you always make sure you're walking towards that, which seems really obvious, but very few people actually do that. So <laughs> that's, that's what, what I did. And I knew I had a bright colored parachute. I had a bright yellow parachute. So. Right. Can I ask um, what parts you made the, you know, the body tube uh, look like a brown cardboard? So it looked very Mad Cow-ish. Uh, who'd you, yes. can you, can I ask who you used your parts from? So obviously yes. you made your own wood parts. And uh, I, I like the disclaimer about the, the non-traditional <laughs> airplane grade wood, right? So that, that was kind of cool. And then you <laughs> yeah, finally yeah. blast your forward centering ring. That was really cool. And it's a good idea too, actually, because I understood how you were concerned, you know, about the eye bolt pulling through that, just that small piece of wood yep, there. So that made piece. a lot of sense yep. to me. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I like that. And I liked how you were doing your, you know, uh, flaying, you know, so that was cool. So good job on that. <laughs> flaying, fillet that fish. Yep, exactly. I do, for the record, I know how to pronounce the word fillet, and it was a joke. <laughs> um, no, I got it. I caught it. I caught it. Thank right you. Away. Thank you. So, yeah. And then um, so, I, I like the way you did your fiberglass layup. And uh, yeah, when you have a minute, I want to talk about that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, the parts that I bought were mostly from Mad Cow. So I got the the cardboard tube from Mad Cow, and I got the nose cone from Mad Cow. Um, oh, okay, cool. And I got the inner tube from Mad Cow. And I got like the Nomex. And and then I ordered the Kevlar harness from... Was it a um, one bad cock recovery? Or, um, yeah, it was. The Kevlar Thank harness? Uh, yeah, so I got the, the three loop 20 foot harness from one mm-hmm. bad hawk. And then um, I got the motor from Wild Men and the rail buttons from Wild Men. And the okay. parachute was actually made by Charlie Garcia and he flew it for his okay. L1 and his L2 because all the cool. parachutes on Mad Cow were sold out when I was looking 
So a good sign probably for Hobby Rocketry that all the parachutes were sold out. Like <laughs> right. 20 inches to 36 inches or something ridiculous. Um, yeah. And then everything so, else I made okay. myself. So I yep. designed and made the centering rings and the fins. Um, and then the, the body tube came in two pieces. And right. instead of a coupling, I just fiberglassed them together. Okay, and I saw how you did that, and that makes a lot of sense, and you did it well. That thing's never going to break. Plus, you don't have that potential. <laughs> you don't have that potential snag from the coupler, you know, from you know all your recovery gear. So that's mm-hmm. that was kind of right. cool how you did that. I, I like that. So, um, yeah, if you guys haven't seen this video, um, give her some more views because uh, she touches a lot of build techniques that um, are common for everybody that's going for their level two and stuff like that now. And just like she said, uh, you know, and 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 Zyla, I looked at that that. Uh, that board that you just made, um, you know, that uh, cutting board. Oh, the, the cutting board and, for my grandmother. <laughs> holy moly. And, and she posted this, guys, like like two hours ago from this recording, so just kind of give you an idea. But, uh, I, you know, we got a lot of uh, woodworking guys here in Colorado. And, um, you know, there's a rock wall uh, place here in Colorado as well that everybody kind of goes to. I think that's what it's called. But, um, you know, I, I saw how, you know, I saw that and I saw the picture that you had initially where you have the wood glue, you know, getting ready to get smeared on there. And then, I looked at the finish of this thing. I just, it's, it's incredible work. So the fact that you're Thank doing you. something that's relative to build a high power rocket, that video is legit, guys. I mean, I, I put my rubber stamp on that because everything that she touches there is kind of stuff that I've explained to s- several different people on how to do some of their builds. And, uh, you know, John, I, I know you're going to love looking at how she does the different stuff with the epoxy. And, you know, this is going to help people. So, Thank I'm going you. to share this video just like I do with uh, Ryan Winslow's video for how to set up an electronics bay. Um, he makes it simple, and you did this for this community. So thank you for that. It's it's going to be a good teaching tool. And thank yeah, you you're so going to get a lot more likes after the back end <laughs> of this. So thank you. Yeah, one of the things that, um, like, I mean, my first place to go when I want to learn how to do this thing is to go to YouTube. Uh, and yeah. when I was building my level two, I couldn't find a lot of videos on, like, full build videos on how to do a level two. So um, no, I agree. With I, that. Yeah. I remember consciously deciding that I was going to do a really good job on filming the actual build so that anyone who wanted to do certifications later on um, would have a reference. But I will say in hindsight, and a, a lot of comments said this, I knew this going in, like I, I built it like a tank. You do not have to do <laughs> a lot of the right. things that I did. I did two overwraps of six ounce fiberglass and then I veneered it. And then I did one point five ounce fiberglass over the veneer to protect the veneer. So like, obviously don't do the <laughs> wow. the veneer. That was yeah. just extra. But then I also tip to tip fiberglass. I fiberglass yep, the that. centering ring with the eye bolt. I did, yeah. So a lot of that stuff, like you could easily apply a level two that is successful without doing that. Particularly if you use a smaller motor. I flew a J595. Um, but I don't think that... If you built exactly what I, I if you build exactly what I did, you're not gonna not pass because of it. <laughs> <laughs> I only used one wrap of six ounce on my level three rocket, so good for you. That's that's nice. like a tank. That was um <laughs> that one was a little bit of a it's like really, really late at night and I didn't think through all the way. So my original plan was actually to do two over wraps of four ounce fiberglass and then the four ounce right. fiberglass I gave them the wrong address <laughs> because mm. I know brilliant <laughs> uh, and so like the day I needed to start building my rocket I just went to West Marine the, the boat store at the okay I, I was going to say this because uh, if you've listened to the show before, when I talk about fiberglassing, I tell everybody if you want six ounce fiberglass and you want to get it quick, quick, <laughs> go to the automotive section at Walmart and grab some of their, uh, you know, DuPont slash, you know, uh, Bondo type. Yeah. Or a boat store. Yeah. It, is a six, it is a six ounce sheet. But, you know, like in the Midwest, there's not a ton of boat stores. So, but there's a ton of Walmarts and they True. all stock it. <laughs> Cleveland, had, I, so, I guess I took it for granted. Cleveland had one because of Lake Erie. Yeah. Right. So I would yep, go to absolutely. West Marine and Cleveland. Oh. But no, yeah. there you go. Um, so, how did you get hooked up with Total Boat? I've known them for a while. I well, because I build boats, <laughs> so it was a it was sort of an easy link to make with them. But um, I actually met them originally at a maker event, and I feel like I've, I've talked about this before, but I I have like one foot in the craftsman maker scene, like which is the woodworkers and the blacksmiths and mm-hmm. um, yep. mm-hmm. the that 
that era. And then I have like one foot in the science and engineering maker scene. And I have a, a, an identity crisis of like, which one am I? You know, uh, and I think I found my <laughs> sweet, sweet spot of like, I get to be both, which is why you end up with a wood veneered rocket. But <laughs> I met them, I met Total Vote at an event at like one of the Craftsman Fair events. Awesome. Yeah, you you actually answered a couple of questions I want to get to right there in one in one felt swoop there. Felt swoop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being efficient here, you know. <laughs> yeah. So do you consider yourself more of a maker type person? I don't it's hard to say. I um I feel like this is sort of hitting on one of my biggest insecurities, which is that like I I have an engineering degree and I worked really, really hard for it, but I don't necessarily use it because I also have found that I really love working with wood and creating things with my hands. And I think like in 2021, the idea of an engineer doesn't actually mean you're working with your hands anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's, I think there's kind of like some stigma on people who go into the trades or work with their hands. And like, I've thought a lot of times about how I would have saved a lot of money and I might, have been a lot happier for my years of schooling if I had decided to go to a trade school or if I had like gone into craftsmanship or in like become a an airplane mechanic or something. So I don't know what I consider myself. I would say like maker and engineer or or something like that. <laughs> maker Truly engineer. A jack of all trades. Yep. Make of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. Cool. We're you're a pilot too, right? I am a pilot too. Oh, yeah. look at that. Look, sweet. Yep. So I did Jack I did roll trades. into the rocket house and immediately say Arrow is better than Astro, which did not make me any friends. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, oh my. <laughs> oh, oh. Too slow. <laughs> not enough fire. Yeah, but I get smoke. to put myself in it. Not enough fire and smoke. Mm. <laughs> like I I can personally fly as high as like a level three rocket, you know. And I, my body can be in the vehicle. <laughs> Well, you could give me time. You, give me time. You can pull a SpaceX and put your body in a in a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I think I do fit in the uh, the criteria that Blue Origin just released for New Shepard today. So <laughs> maybe you'll find me in some capsule when I accidentally become like a multi billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, I became a millionaire. <laughs> Oops, don't know how that happened. <laughs> We're, we're going to take a break here, our, our last break on the Rocketry Show. We're going to come back with more uh, with Zyla Foxlin on our workshop episode here. And we'll be right back right after this. You're listening to The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. I have a question for you, my fellow Rocketeers. Are there times that you've looked into your drawer of miscellaneous doodads and parts that would be great to use for your rocketry projects? How about your old smartphone? Hi, this is Jim, and I've run into this very scenario. I was going through my bins of parts and stuff and found an old Android phone, and I thought it might be time to use this in a rocketry project, right? If you do have a spare Android phone lying around, I found this great app that can turn that Android phone into a full-featured rocket telemetry and video recording system. You can go to the Google Play Store and get the Insane Rocketry app from InsaneRocketry.com, Jason Cook. It is really cool because you set it up in your rocket and fly as you normally would, but this app will give you real-time telemetry data right in the field that will also take video, and you can also help recover your rocket using Google Earth. Now, how cool is that? You guys got to check this out. InsaneRocketry.com and the Insane app for Android devices in the Google Play Store. Insane Rocketry. It's time for Serious Rocketry. Serious Rocketry since 1998, providing the Rocketeer with great kits, motors, supplies, and more. They have lots of products in their ever-growing web store with fast shipping, wide selection, and courteous service. You can also check out the amazing and popular Serious Rocketry kits that harken back to the days of fun to build detailed kits that are more than just three fins and a nose cone. And, uh, Jim, you've been uh, shopping around on the website, as it were. What did you find? Yeah, thanks, CG. It is always fun looking at the Serious Rocketry website. And I found some interesting stuff. Do you ever remember building one of those balsa wood airplanes that you had to put the tissue paper on, but it, it was balsa ribbing? So you had this kind of a skeleton of the rocket, of the rocket, of the airplane before you tissue papered it and made it into something that 
didn't fly very well, but took a long time and it was a lot of fun. Um, how about this one? Uh, Rocketarium has had a history of really cool rockets made out of plywood. And they're actually kind of got that ribbed look like those balsa planes without the tissue paper. And I'm looking at a Rocketarium Mega Rebel. Now, get this. It's it's really cool. It's 18 inches high, got a 24 millimeter motor mount. It's got a central tube, and then it looks like some gradiated <clears throat> centering rings that are going through the tube to make the shape of the rocket. So it looks like a ribbed rocket. It's actually got an open area in it. So it's really something to see at a launch site. You can put anything from a C uh, up to an F in it for all kinds of fun. It's made out of a high-grade plywood. Um, the diameter goes to 5.4 inches, a fin span of 7.5 inches, and uh, an overall length of 18 inches. So it's a, it's a good size, um, you know, park flyer type thing, or you can put a bigger motor in if you wanted to really uh, show off at the launch site. And it's really kind of cool. I've seen a couple of these. Um, I've seen some people that uh, have painted them all kinds of crazy colors, and I've also seen some people that leave them naked and just maybe even put a, a little bit of clear coat on it just to keep the, uh, the wood grain coming. It's a very impressive looking rocket, a great flyer, flies just, uh, flies easily on a C and, and really nicely on an F, uh, F24 or an E20 would be good. So lots of different options for this. <clears throat> it's a lot of fun to build. It's uh, 24 pre-cut pieces of a light aircraft grade plywood. The recovery gear also comes with a Kevlar um, heat shield and, a, and an elastic Kevlar shock cord combo. You could paint it if you wanted to, but I've seen them naked. It flies great. It's a wonderful rocket. This is the uh, Rocketarium Mega Rebel going for the on-sale price of $42.46 from Sirius Rocketry. Thanks, CG. You're welcome, Gene. And Sirius Rocketry's website features real-time stock tracking. So when you make that order, you'll be able to order with confidence because there's no having to call or write to see if something is really in stock. All the stuff is automatically tracked, and uh, you can tell whether or not it's in stock and, you know, order with confidence that way. When you're ready to fly, Sirius Rocketry has motors and hardware in stock from Estes through Aerotech High Power, as well as popular electronics from Jolly Logic and more. Be sure to ask them about their club specials as well. Visit their websites today at siriusrocketry.biz and .com. Sirius Rocketry for the Sirius Rocketeer. Going up in five, four, three, two, one. From Little Beth Media, a new podcast on model rocketry with build techniques, model rocket history, interviews with industry insiders, stuff for beginners and longtime model rocketeers, everything from low to mid power. The Model Rocket Show with me, the Rocket Noob, at themodelrocketshow.com or anywhere you download podcasts. The Rocketry Show would like to thank these listeners for their personal support of the podcast. Timothy Mock. John Seeker, Jeff Curtis, Marcelo Francasa, Phil Bridges, Scott Masters, Roy Tyson, Rob Hoagie, R. Smith, Gary Dow, Jay Pullman, Don Johnson, M. Erisman, Pierre Marlou, Jeff Curtis, Brian Lopato, Philip Calvin, Jay Bryan, Casey Anderson, Terry Dancer, Mark S. and Y., Jim Wilson, Jason O'Scally, and Scott Masters. If you wish to show your support for The Rocketry Show, just visit us at support.therocketryshow.com. Welcome back to The Rocketry Show. This is The Rocketry Show. We're talking to Zyla Foxlin and C.G. Jean as well. And uh, just wanted to add a little uh, note to our uh, little conversation we had just before the break there, and that is like the the backgrounds. And I think what you'll find, it, it, people that get into the rocketry hobby, we have all kinds of backgrounds, and some of them do connect to them, and some of them not necessarily. And you know, for mine, it's professionally I've always been like an audio engineer type person, and and doing announcing stuff for fun. Um, and so, so technically my background is, you know, has been, I've designed equipment that, that's in radio stations and stuff all over the world. And, and, um, and as well as being a person who, who works on equipment at radio stations, keeping radio stations on the air and stuff like that. And in rockets, space and rockets have always been something that have, has interested me uh, ever since, since I was a little kid, really. And so 
it was always a disconnected thing until recently. And, you know, with all of, with the explosion of microcontroller based stuff, I'm able to take mm-hmm. the stuff I've learned working on audio equipment that involves microprocessing and coding and all that and mar- married it with rocketry and, you know, building flight computers and things like that. So now that all these threads are coming together and then now I've got a podcast that so we're talking about it using gear and a studio put together. So, so all <laughs> yeah. this stuff has kind of come together, you know, in the hobby in a funny kind of way. And um, and the funny thing about it, it's, it's, it, it's interesting how certain things like you know, treating audio waveforms and dealing stuff with audio waveforms, how much that stuff directly applies to things like, you know, reading barometric sensor uh, pressure sensors and things that are really noisy and you have to filter the noise out. And it's like, that's a lot like what you have to do with audio to be able to tell what kind of level wow. you've got going on. Kalman so, filters. Yeah, Kalman filters and, and, and others. <laughs> um, and I was able to throw some filters of my own in the algorithm to, to make things a little bit, you know, read a little more accurately um, based on the stuff I've done with audio work. So, so yeah. You know, so even though you're, you, you know, you've got different backgrounds, you know, with the boating and all that, I think you, even you're starting to see how a lot of that stuff kind of comes together in unique Absolutely. ways. In rockets. Oh yeah, big time, big time. Yeah, I mean, like G- learning to work with your hands is mm-hmm. learning to work with your hands, regardless of what you're building. Right, Jim, tell us yours, your background. My backgrounds. Um, well, I I was a commercial photographer. Uh, I started that for about twenty years and did annual report work. And I worked in the studio with <clears throat> computers, wow. kept the kept the studios running. <clears throat> and over time, as things changed, um, the, the, all the digital stuff came in. The day rates for traditional photographers started to go down because p- the uh, CEOs were putting digital cameras in the hands of a, of a uh, office assistant right. and telling them to grab a quick picture. So I'm like, you know, I need to do something else. So. Um, I went into computers a little bit more nine to five ish, and um, started. You know, went to became a lead genius at an Apple store for about ten years. Did all that fun stuff. We launched an iPhone mm-hmm. from the store. Woo! Um, but <laughs> as far as getting into rocketry, this there's there's a, that little side part of it until we bring everything together. When I had my son, um, I was born. I was like, I'm going to do something, father son. This is going to be awesome. He's going to love it. We're going so I walk into a hobby store thinking, yeah, I have no idea. And I started looking down the aisle and I saw a bunch of rockets. And I was like, you know, I used to do that as a kid. I'm an Apollo kid, so <laughs> I I saw them all the Saturns going up as a kid in front of the TV set in the classroom at home. And I loved I, I loved launching rockets as a kid. So I hadn't done it in years. And then I noticed that there was a lot of bigger rockets out there from Estes. And there was these things called composite motors. And then I started mm-hmm. like, you know, I'm going to buy one of these and play with it. So I did. And I started getting into it. And I was like, wait a minute, computers, avionics? Well, how can this be? I want to do it. You know, that kind of thing. And then with the composite motors, the, the power, the smell, the smoke, all that. And I just... You know, in five years, I got my all from nothing to level three, and I've been doing that ever since. So now I'm taking the next step into. So it, it's a it's a lot of what I do. Like I, I agree with what you're saying, Zyla. It's like you have to do whatever you do with your hands. It carries over to anything. So like I've I've been a computer technician for years, and I've always done small fine work with my with little set of screwdrivers and everything. I just kind of upscaled it a little bit to work on rockets, and I get to put in avionics, and fly them and the first the first real thing where I was completely hooked was when I first broke the sound barrier was something that I built in my garage. <laughs> yeah. stuff. Nice. That's a good feeling. I have to say too that I, I was one where my as a kid my dad would take me to fly rockets and you know a little less just rockets that you had at the time. And uh so that's you know and that goes along with my interest in space and rockets and all that too. So so we're we're a part of the the old school way of getting into the rocketry. <laughs> yeah, but like with with Xyla, your 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 generation coming up, it's like you guys have SpaceX, Blue Origin, all this consumer mm-hmm. space stuff going on. I mean, you know, it's got to be an exciting time for you guys because I mean, I've been through this before and it's exciting for me, but it's got to be crazy for you guys. Oh yeah, yeah. I feel like it's kind of the 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 space generation round two <laughs> happening right now. And it's all the people my age where we're like graduating from college and joining companies that are immediately going to be putting people on the moon or like immediately landing rockets that have people in them and stuff like that. So I remember when I was in college, like streaming the like the first few Falcon 9 launches um, mm-hmm. from the like engineering building and like, the, the robotics team and the rocket team all shared some general space. So we'd 
put it on and it didn't matter sure. if you were like on the Baja SAE team, you, you wanted to watch the rocket. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and what's funny is like uh, my, the, the, between the rocketry team and the robotics team at my high school, there's kind of this little, like um, a little bit of a rivalry. <laughs> exactly. And a little, I could see there that. always is. There always, I don't know what, <laughs> what it is. I think it's because you're kind of competing for the same people. <laughs> Uh, it could be. Okay. It could okay. be. You know, and we we always say that we're better because we're faster, and you know, <laughs> and then they come back and say, "Yeah, but you, but can you can you do this?" And like, we don't need to. We're going Mach one. You know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. When I was um, a freshman in college, I was helping both the robotics team and the rocket team submit like funding re- requests for mm-hmm. uh, like that semester of funding, and the robotics team you know, put in a request for like four or five motors, which were the motors that we needed to build that robot. And then the rocket team put in a request for like 30 motors. (laughs) And (laughs) the person in charge of funding was like, the robotics team's reusing their motors. Why can't you guys? (laughs) (laughs) Well, time for education there a little bit, huh? (laughs) Doesn't work that way. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So some finance students got to learn about explosives, which is always a good time. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) So who are some of the people that uh, that inspired you I- along the way? Oh, like uh, big picture or like just rocketry? Both. I have known that I wanted to fly since like as long as I can remember. And I don't know, at some point in middle school, that turned into like space. So I would love to be an astronaut. Um, like every little kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, and I got really into space and really interested in rockets. And then one of my math teachers sort of convinced me I was too stupid to try. So I gave up on the astronaut part of said dream. But I, which is honestly what happens to a huge number of girls mm-hmm. in like from sixth to eighth grade, that is like the highest point of female dropout. And it's usually because right. of like male teachers. Mm-hmm. Um so I was one of those and I decided I hated math and I hated science. I still wanted to be a pilot, but uh, I was just going to go off and do other stuff. So I kind of abandoned that love of rockets and space for a while. And then in high school, I um, had joined the robotics team as a, because like, I knew deep down there was like, there must have been something in me that wanted to do it, even though... I thought I hated both math and science. Um, And then I ended up (laughs) captain of the robotics team. And like when I was applying to colleges, I was really active in the theater department in my high school. And I just remember like it was April 29th or something like college decisions were due very, very quickly. And I was pretty much deciding between the schools that I had been accepted into and only one of them had an engineering program. And like all my theater friends were like, Zyla, you have to do engineering because the rest of us are going to go into theater. So like you have to be the one that goes into engineering. (laughs) Um, So I did that and I like kind of re-embraced it. And then in, in college, I joined the rocket team. Um, So I guess that wasn't like a person, but that was sort of a, you know, like, Oh, I do remember, I forgot which astronaut, but an astronaut came and talked in my school district when I was like in sixth grade. Mm. Um, cool. And that stuck with me. Like I still remember most of the things that she said. Um, awesome. So, what kind of things that 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 really resonated that that yeah. that stay that that fire that kept that fire lit inside of you? The trigger. The trigger. Um, I think I never lost the love of airplanes through the whole thing. I had made a few really good friends in. Um, that were like female pilots at, 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 along my, along the way, and uh, they kind of inspired me to keep going. And I think if you if you can make it as a woman in aviation, like nothing is going to stop you from doing anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is a very brutal world out there. Um, and so I definitely I think like most of my inspiration in aerospace as a whole were female pilots that I got to know. I've always been much more inspired by people that, like peers that I know than Mm -hmm. um, 
like looming large mm-hmm. figures. So going into my level two, it was definitely like a combination of Charlie Garcia, who was helping me a ton with um, my rocket. And then I like Joe and I actually have the same YouTube manager. So I knew Joe and I was watching him build Lumineer in this like accelerated time frame. So I was like, yeah, I can yeah. do the same thing. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so so what's next uh, for you, Zyla? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, I, one of my best friends in college always, his favorite thing to say about me was that I was like a, a, a speedboat that had no compass where I was always going really fast in a direction, but I had absolutely no idea what direction that was. Um, and so that reflects, and part of what I love about YouTube is that, that I can, that can be my job. That's sort of like directionless projects yeah. that pop into my brain for no reason um, can be my job. So I definitely, my list of things, the next video that I release is going to be that tra- transparent wood video, um, which is going to be very, very much just a chemistry video. And then I'll probably do some woodworking after that. I think I want to build a surfboard now that I live in LA. California, my, sure. my, can- my canoe is not as relevant anymore, so I got to keep up with the time. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, you can fiberglass and, it, see? Yeah. Yeah, yep. exactly. Exactly. It's all it's all skills that are the same thing. Uh once you learn to work with your hands, you can do anything. Um yeah, so I think that's that's it. You know, I've been percolating on L3. Not that you heard it from me. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, yeah. and that was my next question. But uh but check this out. So um are you gonna you promise then to stay in rocketry? Because that that's like the goal that I talk to with everybody that's starting out <laughs> again. Uh, born again rocketeers and people who just got in the hobby is like once you get your level one, stay in the hobby, do more things. And once you get your level two, stay in the hobby, do more things, learn everything else. So you're gonna stick around for a while, right? Yeah, I'll probably at least do my level three. Um I'm very goal oriented. Like I really like acquiring random certifications. Like I have a yeah. plethora of certifications <laughs> that I'm never going to use. Uh, I thought that my level one was one of those, honestly, and now I've used it. So maybe like one day I'll actually get into ham radio or like I actually get <laughs> oh, there into. You go. I'm I'm a certified yeah. forklift driver for no reason. Oh, <laughs> so. congratulations, congratulations. Um, yeah, I got to do that. I think. Oh, this summer I am planning to get my hot air balloon license to add on to my pilot's license. Nice. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, just acquiring certifications is definitely a hobby of mine. And so an L3 okay. falls neatly into that category. But the problem is, like, once you have an L3, where do you go from there? Space? Well, <laughs> oh, there's tons. Well, of actually, oh, actually, experimental. Actually, yeah. yes. Uh, you know, the, you, there's a few of the smaller um, rocket companies out there that basically were people who transitioned from level three into mm-hmm. starting a rocket company launching things in a low Earth orbit. So, uh, yeah. In, in fact... Uh, you know, one of our one of our longtime sponsors, uh, Matt Steele, who owns North Coast Rocketry, he's in the mm-hmm. rocketry all the time. But you know, as he mentioned in the previous episode, that you know he's someone who whose fingerprints are on things that are in orbit right now. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> you, know, you know, working for the rocket company. So you never know. You never. That's know. awesome. And also True. with on the certification, so you can get your ham license, and then you can get into telemetry things using ham devices yep. on a on a level two or level three. I rocket. do already have my ham license. Yeah. Oh, there you so go. I- um, there you go. Yeah, I think I I definitely want to fly APRS on my next rocket just because I think APRS is really cool. Uh, yeah, my weather I'm, balloon I'm, payload was a um, RTL SDR. Okay, I've been tinkering with the idea of a spaceship, but that requires a little bit more than just me. I think as I'm looking <laughs> at it, so <clears throat> I've, I've, yeah. I've drummed that idea. <laughs> You need a team yeah. for that. But Jim, let's talk about let's talk about stuff after level three because you and I talk about it all the time, and we mm-hmm. mentioned some things on a few of the shows. And I know that you're looking to potentially start learning how to build EX motors. You know, doing it the correct and safe way our, from all the mentoring yeah. that you have. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I've then, got some great yeah. mentors. Uh, some of the guys, uh, Chris Pearson, and um, you know, has helped me a lot, quite a lot along the way. I've mixed up a couple of batches of propellants. I'm working on getting some formulas together, and then I'm going to learn how to tweak them because I like high thrust motors, awesome. like a Blue Thunder motor. That's that's the thing that has a lot of punch to it. I like that motor a lot yeah. for the stuff I built because I build heavy just because I like to build tanks and watch them fly. But I also like to make sure that they stick around for a while. So right, I'd rather right. put a bigger motor in a heavier rocket than a smaller motor in a rocket that if it lands is going to break. So 
That's that's right. just me. The, the Thank you. Everybody's that's the, the anthem of Fifi right there. I'm gonna just repeat that. To <laughs> that's all exactly why I was enamored by that video because I was like, man, she built a hell of a tank, you know. <laughs> and, it, it was well, great. and I think I said that it was like reliable design is sexy to design, and if reliability means nice. building a tank, if you don't have to go that high, I'd rather like you know see a gorgeous. Yeah, motor and from, get you know, for me, it's not it's not the altitude thing. It's like the whole experience of watching the flight, you know, and the sound. And if it goes lower, it's like less I got to walk, you know. I mean, that's what I look at. <laughs> True. Because exactly. I'm carrying 70 pounds of rocket with me, and I usually, like, it's it, 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 trudging through a cornfield with a 70-pound, 13-foot, 8-inch diameter fiberglass rocket is a little bit of a chore sometimes. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually, I got to, I got to learn that by, I, I decided to carry the bottom half of Lumineer out of the desert. <laughs> oh, and I, you know, I'm like the tiniest person on the recovery crew. And I was like, I can do it. Let me do it. <laughs> I, and then like halfway through, I'm dying, but I'm too stubborn to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. All right. So uh, let me, let me talk about a couple of things. Uh, the stuff to do after level three. Here's, here's my, the plan that kind of comes out of my head. So I talked on a few episodes back. I want to start building some intricate builds because, um, I, you know, I was using the time that I had now to, you know, do some prototypes for some folks and do some, you know, level two flights that would ramp me up to my level three. So I did that. I got my level three on the same day that you did your level two. So congratulations to you. You know, um, four, you. congratulations three, two, one. To you. That, that was done on purpose, right? Four, three, two, one. So, you know, it, anyway, we're going to um, say yes. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Go so um, I'll, I'll take so, um, yes for 500, Jack. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I miss that show. So, I mean, so check this out. Um, I'm going to start building some intricate builds. I want to build that N1. Talked about it on an episode of E-Rockets. I, I want to build that rocket. And there's a couple of uh, other kits that are out for the same thing. And I've looked at both of them and I think I made a decision on which one I'm going to buy. I definitely want to build that and I want to cluster it because that's one thing I want to do is clustering. Then I want to take my five and a half inch bullet that I got from Locke. And I want to cluster those 538s. And then I also want to try to do combinations of air starts on those, which will lead into bigger rockets that I want to air start. Mm -hmm. um, I have this Nike Apache that I got from a hobby store that's just kind of chilling in the corner there. And I'm going to do some weird things with that rocket at some point now that I understand how the electronics work, how I can do the staging, how we can do the timers. You know, the egg timer um, episode that we did, you know, a while back, um, perfect timers for that. So, I mean, I, I'm going to, I'm going to start playing a lot of stuff. I got so many plans, but my I have, next immediate I, plans. Yeah. Yeah. No, as I say, I have ahead. three staging timers, uh, some of the perfect Ooh. flight ones, and, and I'm just holding on to those because I've already done staging twice, but nice. I want to go bigger with it. So I'm thinking oh, yeah. multiple it's, stages, not just one. So, because that is part of what could lead to a potential space shot. Oh, dude. I'm just fascinated wow. in doing, you know, side mount boosters that drop off when they're done with a sustainer that keeps going somehow. <laughs> That's cool too. See, it's all cool, you know. And then, and then I want to make my and do my own experimental motors in this multi-staged space shot rocket. That's the dream. There it is. There, there. I don't talk about it, but there it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good dream. Yes. That's a good dream. Yeah. Now I just got to figure out how to do it. So. Sila, where can we find you if somebody wants to just follow what you're up to? Yeah, um, I build rockets and also often not rockets. Um, you can find <laughs> me at Zyla Foxlin, X Y L A F O X L I N, uh, on pretty much every platform. And my YouTube channel is just my name, Zyla Foxlin. So it's easy to find. Or if you type in wood rocket, uh, no, don't don't type in wood rocket. Actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> If you search wow. for Xylofox okay. and Rocket, you'll find my rocket. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and congratulations on your level two video as well as your level two. Um, I mean, the video itself is, like I said, it's got over 130,000 hits, Thank I believe, you. right now, to, right today, as of today. Yeah, I think I put more so. hours into the video than into building the rocket. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now as we wind down here, one of the things that Zyla touched on was, you know, discouragement from a teacher or another authority figure um, so I figured, you know, we can, if you have that issue with a daughter or if you are a daughter and you run into something and you want to know where can you find people to look to, to do what you want to do, if rocketry is one of the things you want to get into, you know, a person that comes to mind immediately for me is Carol Marple. She's been in a hobby for a while and is a member of the NAR and Jesse, you have a list of folks that, you know, could be potential people to look up to and learn from in the hobby and be inspired from. So what do you have there? So in this hobby, in this hobby, there are 
tons of women that, you know, I, I'm going to name a few, um, you know, that are level two and above for high power rocketry that make waves with some of the stuff. And, and you know, and uh, CG and Jim, you're going to know the most popular one here. Mm-hmm. But um, we've got Amy Howe from Cloudbusters. Um, she's also one of the officers of the club and she helps arrange all the high power flights, you know, for Airfest specifically, um, you know, and for LDRS when it goes there. And, you know, she, she does a lot of stuff for high power rocketry in the Midwest. So, you know, so Amy, thank you for your efforts with that. Um, you have, uh, you know, uh, Jen Gatewood, who I interviewed with Jason Chamberlain at the NARUM uh, interview that we did in 2018 CG. Mm-hmm. Um, she just got her level two and she's ramping up and doing a lot of stuff and she's going to work to be, you know, a level three person soon. So, you know, uh, there's some important stuff coming from her. Um, we have Nikki Terrio, who is our resident Midwest level three person who flies, you know, with the wild man camp. And she's always part of, you know, um, Quad Cities and a few of those groups there. Um, you'll see her do a lot of amazing stuff in Midwest Power and Airfest. So, you know, Nikki, thank you for your efforts because I actually learned a lot from her, you know? So, I mean, I can't discredit any of them because they are so smart and they do so much and they've taught me a lot, all of them. So, um, and then of course you got, you know, the well-known rocket queen, uh, Rachel Daigle, who is a car level three, um, you know, for the Canada scene. Uh, and she uh, just recently got that and she's going to be one of the first women in Canada to get her level four certification and she's looking to do that next year. So we're excited to follow her trend on that. And then, you know, one of the most popular that everybody knows is Ms. Gloria Robinson, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> you know, her, you know, her and Robert run AMW Motorworks and, uh, you know, they sell anything from motors to fiberglass to cardboard to the little Estes kit. And, you know, their, their love of rocketry, you know, just kind of spans out to everybody and everyone, you know, she's happy to meet everybody and teach and, and everything else. So, you know, the women that we have in rocketry, it's just amazing. Yeah. And then uh, Taylor, Taylor Walden, you know, um, she lives in, you know, the Texas area and I believe she's going to go to the Salt Flats for LDRS this year and she's going to get her level three on an end motor and a huge mad cow fiberglass rocket. So Taylor, we're excited to follow your trends. So Zyla, you got a lot of friends and a lot of people that will be there to support you, including us and including all these folks. So look them up and, uh, you know, let's make some friends. And, and, <laughs> and there are more out there. Those are just oh, the, some of the more. ones that come to the, come to mind right now. Yeah. They're the ones that yeah. I know. <laughs> the rocket sisterhood is very real. <laughs> I love seeing the women of STEM thing happening. Cause that's, it's just, it's cool to see because it's, it's well-deserved and it's, it's about damn time. Quite honestly. <laughs> oh yeah. Good call. Yeah. Truth. Good call. Yes. Truth. Yeah. Tell, stop telling the girls yeah. in the class that they're not smart enough to do the science and, and the space stuff. That just irks me. I've I've watched that happen yeah. even <laughs> since I was a teenager, and it just it irks me. Yeah, and give your your daughters the same kits exactly. that you give your sons. Yep, yeah. important. Indeed. Cool. You know, when I did my level three, my my stepdaughter was out there with me, and she photographed the whole thing, and she she had a fun time. And she's like, "Yeah, I'll totally go again if you if you do another big flight like that, I'll totally go again." And you know, uh, one thing when I was doing my level three is I had my wife there with me, and she is very supportive in the sense that I do this hobby, but you know, you know, just being on the podcast and, you know, being, you know, a tester for other companies to do their releasing things like that. And, you know, the build stuff that I've done and, you know, try to share and try to help people along the way. She sees that and she was there next to me when I did my level three to hold my hand. And she is now going to launches with me. So, I mean, I, I'm super appreciative of the women in my life and how they support my hobby. So take them to your launches, guys. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We actually had, I think, um, we had more on our, our little, our space homies, uh, launch day. I think we had more women get certified than men. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Cool. Did you just say space homies? That's another hashtag right there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it actually is. We are the space I mean, homies. <laughs> yeah, it is. It exists. <laughs> Um, space Twitter yeah. is a very odd place. <laughs> it is a very, very odd place. I feel like I got thrown straight into it with no warning. I went from like wood Twitter to space Twitter and it was whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I mean, I, I don't do, I don't really do Facebook or any of the, any other social stuff. It's just the, the Twitter I find intriguing and then just, and then space Twitter is its own little crazy subgenre of, of bizarre awesomeness and also ridiculousness that I find myself drawn to it for some reason. Maybe it's because that's kind of like I am, I guess. But yes. Yeah, for sure. It's a good place. <laughs> yes. So as we wind down here on this show, I want to throw out a couple of reminders. Don't forget the Model Rocket show is returning into regular production, our sister show. And uh the new will be talking to Chris Michelson, Model Rockets, and uh and, and a lot of more good things to come as well. 
And uh, let's see, what else we have going on? We are, oh, yes. I was talking to one of our patrons, John Sicker. Uh, we just got into this this chat for a while, and I want to get. I think this is. I think this will go over well with our listeners. So I'll get a Jim and uh, and um, Jesse. Let me know what you think here, and you, the okay. listeners out there, let us know in the mailbag. But the two of us are really into telemetry in a really sick, twisted kind of way and deep. <laughs> uh, and and we started chatting back and forth on on the messenger, like. For forever talking about what we want to do with telemetry, and I was thinking, you know, this might make a good topic for you know work, future workshop episode where, where the two of us just just go and put our propeller heads hats on and start talking telemetry talk. Yeah, and let's yeah. do it. And he's wondering, like, would that bore people? And I was like, I don't think so, but you know, I think it'd be <laughs> no. <good. laughs> so yeah, so that's that's something. You know, the, to work. the feedback I get on all the episodes that we do CG is it's you know there's a lot of hit and miss and you know there's a lot of hits though. So I mean we have to talk about that stuff because it's it's across the board. So and, and John, hey, how's it going? And I talk to John once in a while too. So <laughs> no, that's a that's a good plan. I think. I think so too. So we love watching it. your guys' stuff when you when you share pictures with me and Gene. Like I just I, I get dumbfounded. <laughs> so it's it's cool <laughs> stuff. It really is cool, and I'm not just saying that to say that. If I didn't mean it, I wouldn't say it. It's it's intriguing, and I wish I was at that level. <laughs> well, a lot of people so. ask me about it, and and I'm no telemetry expert. I'm just kind of learning, um, and you know, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll I'll just keep at it until I, until I get something that works reliable enough for for mission. So so it'll be fun to talk about. Um, and and real quick too, um, I am ramping up to do the. I, I just dropped the hint here when I pulled out the section of Aries from the workshop on the on the other side of the studio here. Um, and, the, and Aries is coming along, the new avionics section is coming in with the with the flight computer. I, I'm not sure if I'll be flying the first flight of Aries with the new flight computer I'm working on or if I'm going to just refly the one from the last test, that, that last right. successful test that we did, which I'm leaning towards that right now. And But the idea now is it'll do a full dual deploy rather than just triggering at apogee which there we go. which i think it'll i think All it'll be up fine testing baby well it, it's going to be partial because uh because half of that was already tested on the on the uh mr bean rocket so now it's just a matter of just getting the whole flight sequence to happen using my flight computer so yeah a, a, cool. along with telemetry wow. data and so the new flight computer really is going to be fo- focused on well, actually, there's a change because Joe Barnard kind of gave me the idea. And one of the things I've <laughs> that been... Joe guy. Yeah, that Joe guy. Because um, <laughs> one of the things that, that, that's been on my mind that's really been bugging me is I can record the data on the rocket, which I can get some really robust data if I just record what's going on in the flight computer on board the rocket while it's going. More so than I can get on the telemetry link because there's, there's a limited amount of bandwidth right, you can packets. use for that. Yeah. So what I what I send down is a subset of data that's available, and I don't send it as often. So at least you get an idea of what was going on, but the but there's no real tight record because Rocket's not recording it yet. I've got the memory on the on the last few versions of the flight computer to do it. But the trick has been getting that information off of the flight computer and into another computer. And and there are ways you can do that, but that's like an involved process. And I was sort of like, oh, I really don't want to get into that. I just want to get the data off. <laughs> and so what what inspired me with Joe is, and I think I mentioned this on another show, is, yeah, that, yeah. is that he has an SD card on the rocket. <laughs> so when the rocket's done and it sees that the flight's over, it dumps all that data onto the SD card, you know, and I'm going, huh, yeah, of course. So that's one of the big things that's delaying the next... Uh, iteration of the the next block iteration, version yeah. of the flight computer is that I'm starting to think about okay I want to put an SD card reader on this thing and I need to come up with a routine to dump that data off. That's a lot easier to do than trying to come up with a with a routine to to communicate with some external application to pull the data off and that. Nah, nah. So yeah, so that's where I'm at with that. So I think, but I want to move it forward. I definitely want to do a full dual deploy. So I'm just going to reuse the other flight computer and keep the telemetry system up and going. Um. The the challenge is going to be is whether or not because this flight computer that I flew the last few times I think I mentioned is I'm running it at a lower power setting than than the previous versions and the new flight computer I'm going back to that because the way the data I'm sending out I'm sending real time or attempting to send down real time 
GPS coordinates that can communicate to another unit that'll that'll show you in real time where the rocket is as it's coming down in flight and coming down. So that's putting an extra load of of data on the processor. So I have to check and see. It's I'll either be able to do that or I'll have to forego that and fly it the old fashioned way, that you know, so to speak. <laughs> so that's kind of where I'm at on the project. If anybody's wondering where I'm at on CG's project because I haven't said a lot about it lately, that's where I am. So. Oh, there you go. There's that workshop episode. And uh, and thanks for being on the show with us, Isla, as you quietly listen to all that. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, I love it. I love it. I did mechatronics, so uh, that was oh, my wow. act. background is. <laughs> nice. Cool. <laughs> and the robotics and everything yep. else. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for being on with us. That was yeah, of course. Good. Thank you so much really for having me. The, the rocket world is very, very welcoming. Good. Yeah, it, it should be. And that's the thing that we, we want to stress, too, is like that's part of what we're doing is we're trying to create the bridges between all of that so that, you know, because everybody wants to help each other. It's not like a competition, except that we all just want to fly stuff, you know? Yep. True. Yep. So and thanks Speaking. again for um, for not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. And thanks for not considering me a troll on Twitter when I when I message you. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, you're, you're totally fine. You're good. <laughs> well, cool. Uh, well, we'll look forward to seeing what else you come up with. And, and, and if it's a rocket thing, we'll be watching closely to see what you do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and so much. Maybe have you maybe have you back on the show if you like. Yeah. Yeah, when I get my L3, you know. There you go. Just speak it in Hells existence. yes. <laughs> yes. No way, man. No way. No way, guys. We're going to have her on um, th- th- throughout the process, you know, ramping up to that level three. So that, that's the deal. So <laughs> Knowing me, you, it'll, there, you won't get a chance because I'll do it in like five days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll there, pro- there procrastinate go. until five days before Hot Nozzle Summer and then decide to do it. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Well, we'll see you all next time on the Rocketry Show. Have a great one. And thanks again, Tyler. And on that note, Gene. Keep your eyes in the skies. (laughs) See you next time. Have a comment? We'd love to hear it. Send them to mailbag at therocketryshow.com. If you enjoyed what you heard, don't forget to check out our sister show, themodelrocketshow.com. The Model Rocket Show is hosted by the Rocket Noob and is all about low to mid-power rocketry. Themodelrocketshow.com with Daniel, the Rocket Noob check it out today. The views and opinions expressed on these programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Little Beth Entertainment or its sponsors. The stories of recovery, moving from darkness into the light. You're invited to experience Recovery Talks, the podcast, the show about showcasing the lantern holders in recovery, those who are making it every day. Download it wherever you get your podcasts and learn more at recoverytalks.org.